electronic engineer and technical journalist, member of several hackerspaces, and I'm also here with an organization called Stichting Trans Rescue Foundation. Uh, we get transgender people out of dodgy parts of the world. Uh, so without further ado, <laughs> without further ado, let's start the talk. Now, I don't have a car at the moment because uh, I was made homeless in 2020 and when I moved I actually passed on my cars to uh, friends. My, uh, my modern, which is a Volkswagen Polo, 20 years old, went to uh, my cousin's kid who's a Vox enthusiast, will take care of it. And my classic, which is a 1960 Triumph Herald 948, went to the son of a friend in the Herald community because he will yet again take care of it and like it. And I realised that... This gives me an interesting position. I've had cars all my life. I drive, you know, I'm, I'm, I enjoy spannering cars. And for the first time in my life, I don't have a car, because where I live, I don't actually need one. But I do want to have a car, and I realise that nowadays, you have to understand that probably fossil fuel cars have had their day, and my next car will have an electric motor. And... I want it to be a really good car. I want it to be, have an incredible range. I want it to be efficient. I want it to be spacious. I want it to be the best car I've ever had. And more to the point, it'll almost certainly be a new car. It probably won't be an electric version of some previous car where they've whipped out the internal combustion engine and dropped in a, uh, a, an electric motor. It will be a fresh start. And this is a fresh start for the automotive industry, that cars have developed over the last 100 years, and they've picked up a lot of baggage along the way. And so I want my electric car to be genuinely different. It's probably the best car I've ever owned. So, hang on. If you drive a car now, particularly if you drove a car 40 years ago or so, you'll notice a difference. Your car now is an amazing piece of engineering. It will carry four people at motorway speeds all day. It won't use much fuel. Most cars nowadays, you're in the 50, 60 miles per gallon. I'm afraid I don't know what that is in liters per 100 kilometers, but they don't use much fuel. Um, it won't rust. It'll last a long time. Its metallurgy and rust protection is fantastic. It's oil with synthetic oils in the engine. Your engine just doesn't wear out. Now, if any of you have owned classic cars or any of you started your driving career decades ago, that wasn't the case. When I started driving, which is nearly over 30 years ago now, um, cars rusted. You know, we, if you had a 10-year-old car or a car over 100,000 miles, in a lot of cases, you're doing quite well because you had 2050 multi-grade oil and what passed for steel and paintwork in the 1970s. So it wasn't uncommon to see five-year-old cars rusted out in a scrapyard. You remember all those adverts with a car driving through the surf and looking, hey, this is a car for adventurous people. You would not want to own that car afterwards because that much salt, it would have rusted by the time it got off the beach. So nowadays, make no mistake, if you think your car isn't very good, compared to what it was, it's amazing. But how did they get this good? Now, I don't know if any of you have driven a Fiat 127. I'm making a controversial statement here. In most cases, this car here is the ancestor of your current car. Because most cars nowadays have a transverse engine at the front, front wheel drive, and the gearbox on the end of the engine. There are a few outliers, like, say, the Citroën Traction Avant from the 30s that was front-wheel drive with the engine in line. There's the Mini. Mini fans will probably jump up and down. We did it first. But Alec Isagonis put the gearbox underneath the engine and shared the oil with the engine. The Fiat 127, or possibly, though, I think there was an Innocenti came just before it, was the first, what I would say is the first modern car. They stuck the gearbox on the end of the engine, gave it front-wheel drive, made the first modern Super Mini. You don't drive a Fiat 127 
but you drive its spiritual successor. You almost certainly drive one of these. Now, the Fiat 127, we used to own one. It's a really, really good little car. Trust me, if there's anybody from the Italian embassy here, nobody makes small cars like the Italians. They're brilliant. However, sorry Italian friends, particularly in the 1970s, my God, nobody made cars like the Italians did. Uh, these, these cars were famous for rusting and everything broke. I actually, about 10 years after this one was made, um, my Fiat Panda, my, one of my first cars was a Fiat Panda, the old boxy Fiat Panda. And I always say it's the best car I ever owned and the worst car I ever owned. It's the worst car I ever owned because everything broke. It rusted through the bulkhead, all the plastic things broke. It's also the best car I ever owned because it's a small Italian car. And it's like having a little dog with a ball saying, play with me, play with me. Uh, it's got a digital accelerator. It's either on or it's off. So you hoon around the roads in a hail of revs and you have incredible fun when you're in your early, early 20s like I did. But a lot of cars in the 70s were pretty awful. And manufacturers realized this, that their cars weren't lasting 10 years and people were getting sick of it. People weren't buying cars because they rusted. And so they put a lot of effort into making their cars better. The engines got better, the metallurgy got better, the oil got better. They went to great efforts to rust proof. This picture, I don't know if any of you recognize this. This is actually an Audi advert from the late 1980s. Um, it's, I think, an Audi 80. And the whole premise of the advert was this billionaire has his super yacht in Monaco and he instructs his captain that he wants the car. So the captain loads up the crane and the car is being winched over, but something goes wrong and the car lands in the sea. And the whole point of the advert is, but that's okay because it's galvanized, it won't rust. Uh, and this shows just how much manufacturers in the 80s, what, what lengths they went to to say, our cars don't rust, our cars last. This is when cars started to become really good rather than almost good. I mean, I remember early 90s Fiat, when they launched the Fiat Tipo, the 90s Fiat Tipo, its big selling point was it was the first Fiat with galvanized uh, body panels because Fiat's had this dreadful rust uh, relationship. So, if cars are so good, why have they got baggage? Why are they all so, so, all so bad? Now, I'm going to illustrate with a procession of cars. This is a Triumph Herald 948 from 1959. This isn't my car, but I drove one of these for about 25, 30 years. Um, my car is, as I say, with my friend's son at the moment, and he's really enjoying it. And this is a very old-fashioned car. It's one of the last British cars made with a separate chassis. And the point with this car is, it's horribly unreliable. All sorts of things break, it rusts. But the flip side of that is, there is nothing on that car. Even nowadays, there aren't many parts on that car that cost more than 100 euros. Most, most parts cost 10 euros. And you can repair that car in almost anything with a very simple set of spanners and screwdrivers. I know because there's almost no part of a Triumph Herald I haven't taken to pieces. Uh, and so this is, on one respect, a very bad car, but on another respect, it's a very good car because you can keep them running for 60 years with minimal effort. I know because I've done it. Let's move forward. I put 1983 there, that's 1992. I am so bad. That is a Volkswagen Polo 6M. It's... Uh, it's basically, they had the Golf Mark I, then the Golf Mark II, then the new Golf Mark III was a much larger platform, so they renamed the Golf platform the Polo and kept on making it. This is a car from the early 90s. It has some characteristics in common with the Herald. It's actually quite possible as a geek to repair one of these in your garage. There are a lot of electronics in there, but there's nothing too difficult to deal with. Uh, it's got uh, a catalytic converter, it's got uh, electronic ignition, it's got oxygen sensors and stuff like that. But, you know, if you're prepared to learn about how those work, you can fix this car. This is a Focus C-Max. This is actually the first car I've shown you where I haven't actually owned one or driven one. Uh, this, I use this one because my friend has one. Uh, it's, it's a people carrier from the mid-2000s. And I always remember the first time I sat in it. It was the first time I'd sat in a car 
where the experience of turning the car was of it booting up. <laughs> this thing, at least, I don't know if this one here, but uh, my, my friend's Focus C-Max, the whole thing in front was a TFT, and you literally got a logo, a boot logo. And I strongly suspect if you delved in behind, you'd probably have a Linux prompt. Now, when she had it, it was actually a little old, so everything was starting breaking. And everything was all in one computer. And to be honest, from a repairability point of view and a complexity point of view, this thing is not repairable. You will see 60-year-old Triumph Heralds around. You will probably, at the moment, see 35-year-old Volkswagen Golf Mark IIs and Polo 6Ns around. I'd be very surprised if you see any Focus C Max is more than 15 or 20 years old. There'll always be somebody who has one, but they've managed to make a car that is brilliant in every way. It doesn't rust, its engine goes on forever. You can go to the moon and back if you change the oil regularly in one of those, but they won't make more than 10 or 15 years old because that digital dash will break. And this is the problem facing car makers, that they've made incredible cars, but they don't want them to last forever. They want them to die. They want them to die early. And so I've used the phrase complexity as the new rust. Basically, when I, when I started my motoring career, basically, we all had cars that were about 10 years old, but they were rusty as anything, and we got to know body filler and all the tricks to get them through the APK, the MOT in the UK. Um, but nowadays, you can have a 20-year-old car and it's just rust-free. This is a miracle. But that's really bad for the car manufacturers. So they've basically upped the complexity where if something broke in the Herald, it would cost you 10 pounds, 15 euros, and a day with a screwdriver. If something breaks in the C-Max, you'll take it to the dealer, and they will say, mm, well, that, that's, that module will cost you 1,500 euros, and that's more than the car's worth, and so you scrap it. So if you go into a modern scrapyard, you will find it is full of cars that, back in the 80s when I started driving, we could only dream of. <coughs> cars with perfect engines, perfect bodywork, that are only in there because something too complex and too expensive has broken. So here we are in 2022. The problem with electric cars is that an electric car is fundamentally a very simple piece of kit. If you want to see how simple an electric car can be, if you go around these hacker camps, you'll probably see hacky racers. If you see my friend Mike's little tykes uh, cozy coop thing driving around, that's a hacky racer. That's an electric car stripped to its essentials. Now, that is not road legal, but it's a good illustration of what you need for an electric car. You need a floor pan platform, so you need something with wheels, suspension, brakes, etc. You need an electric motor and a transmission. You need a motor controller. You need a battery manager and probably you need something to manage the anti-lock brakes. That's three computers, three microcontrollers, and you can make a road-legal electric car, motor controller, power management, and anti-lock brakes. The trouble is, these are not the electric cars we're getting. I mean, if you drive an electric car, I'm guessing that you quite like the toys. You fire up your Tesla, even your Nissan Leaf, whatever. TFTs everywhere. You know, toys. You didn't pay for some heap of shites with, like, just one dial. You paid for the experience. And the trouble is, particularly with things like Teslas, Teslas go out of support before they're 10 years old. Teslas, actually, Teslas also have awful build quality. I think I would prefer a Yugo to a Tesla, because I actually prefer a car with build quality. <laughs> um, and the problem is, we're repeating exactly the same problems as we did with the petrol cars beforehand, that we're producing zero ta tailpipe emission cars that won't be put off the road by emissions legislation. And so the manufacturers are making damn certain they come off the road by loading them with unnecessary features and integrating the features. So when the technology dies, the car dies. And 
I would, prepare to put, I would be prepared to put money on it that if I were to walk into a scrapyard in, let's say, 2030 or 2035, I would find it full of Nissan Leafs and Teslas and e-Golfs and, uh, oh God, what's the other? Your, your normal crop of current day um, electric vehicles that are in perfect condition. They still have plenty of capacity in the battery. They have no rust. You could, they look as though you could drive them away, but they will be dead and they will be in the scrapyard because some loaded extra feature has died, which costs a fortune to replace, and the owner has just said, I'm going to scrap it. And thus, I'd say that when environmental soundness is linked to longevity rather than to tailpipe emissions, an electric car that lives for less than 10 years, or even less than 20 years, isn't environmentally sound at all. I mean, I think I'd rather go a more environmental route. Um, I'd hazard a guess that driving a diesel pickup truck fueled by endangered whale oil would probably be more environmentally sound. Oh, geez, there it goes. Help. Oh, we're back. Yay! So, coming back to what I said about the hacky racers. An electric car, this is, this is actually a prototype Ford electric car from about 1914. And as you can see, it's an electric car stripped to the minimum. Personally, looking at that, it's got brakes on the back wheels only, and it's got lead-acid battery, and it's got no safety features whatsoever. Maybe that's a bit too minimalist. But really, it comes back to what I was saying about the hacky racers. <coughs> to make an electric car, you do not need all the extra things. It's a, it's a genuine ex a opportunity for manufacturers to throw away the baggage and make much simpler cars with longevity in mind. If they're serious about environmental soundness, they need to look at the way they make cars and make them for lifetime environmental soundness, not just the smug feeling of the first person who drives it off the forecourt. So, this is something I came up with for Hackaday a while back, the Minimal Motoring Manifesto, which is, this is how I want to see cars made. I don't know if you lot agree with me. I'm guessing there'll probably be one or two automotive engineers in the audience who will tear me to shreds in the comments, but this is a hill I'm prepared to die on. Personally, I would like to step into a car, something like a Willis Jeep, with one dial in front of me and minimal controls. But I realize not everybody is like me. Right? People expect the toys, they want the toys, they've, they've earned the right to the toys. So, yeah, fair enough, you should have toys in a car if you want to. But car design needs to be able to deliver the toys without without delivering that built-in planned obsolescence of one thing breaks and the whole car is scrap. So here's the manifesto. Separate the subsystems. Why are unnecessary subsystems integrated closely with necessary ones? Why, when something that is unnecessary for the car breaks, do I have to replace a module which costs a fortune because it runs every other subsystem on the car. Why, when something unnecessary on the car breaks, can I not just ignore it and keep driving and keep going for an APK and keep, or MOT and keep the car on the road? When my Triumph Heralds... I try, the Triumph Herald is a bad example because it has no toys. OK, when my Polo 6N's air conditioner died or, other, or central locking died or any of its other subsystems, and believe me, all its subsystems did eventually die. I could keep driving the thing because it still had enough of its subsystems separate that it kept on the road. The speedometer worked, the lights worked, whatever. That Focus C-Max, if almost anything dies, anything affects that um, CAN bus, whatever, the whole bloody lot dies. And when you've had the experience of seeing somebody with a headlight bulb that's broken. And it's not just a headlight bulb like it was in the Triumph Herald. It's a fucking computer system, and there's a microcontroller in there that's died, so they're stuck with no headlights by the side of the road. You start wondering, maybe complexity is the enemy of the motorist. 
The next thing on the manifesto is provide a minimal way in. Now, we're all familiar with OBD2. Um, most of us have probably got one of them little Bluetooth dongles you plug into your car and you can read off all sorts of interesting stuff. Now, OBD2 is great. It's a standard because some parts of it are standard. Now, of course, every manufacturer has extended the standard and made it non-standard. I would suggest, I would like to advance the proposition that we need a standard for essential services in a car. So if something very expensive dies and means that you can't get it through an APK, you need to be able to unplug that digital dash or that module and throw it away and drop in an open source one that provides the essential services needed. Throw away the toys, just put in an open source speedometer or whatever that just works. But it comes down to the last one is, if you read reviews of mobile phones, I mean, I know this, I'm a journalist. When you're writing a review of something, you need to find something to get excited about. And I actually pity people who review mobile phones because all mobile phones are basically the same. They're a black slab. I mean, even if, this is actually quite galling. If you basically, if you pay 1,000 euros for an iPhone, you get a black slab. If you pay 50 euros for an Alcatel, you get a black slab. And they look absolutely identical from a distance. And as a journalist, when you're writing about this stuff, you've basically got to sort of find the things that you can say, oh, the iPhone is so special because it has a curved edge or something stupid. But it's basically, sorry, it's a black slab. And this is the same problem with cars. That there was a time when cars were all different. I mean, if you go back to the 1970s, you could genuinely, if you wanted a car with a rear engine, there were several ones. If you wanted a car with adventurous styling, there were several ones. If you wanted a, a rear-wheel drive car, you could take a choice. <coughs> but to be honest, now you look at the models from the main manufacturers and you can't get a cigarette paper between them. They're so similar and they're all very bland. And when you read reviews and things, the reviews are all about the toys in the cab because the poor journalist has got nothing else to write about because the car itself is so boring. And I would turn around and I would say, if you're a designer of cars, you need to go and drive a 1950s car and find what makes a car fun to drive without bells and whistles. Because if you can make a car that doesn't need all the extra crap, you've probably made a better car in the first place. A friend of mine used to, had a, basically he's tried to start a business in kit cars and it failed. And he came to me and he said that the car business, you're one of, either one of two types of people. You're either a crook or a dreamer. Now, I'm not in the car business, but I realize that this, the thesis I've just delivered makes me a dreamer because it's never going to happen. It's not in the interests of car manufacturers to make cars that last longer. They want to flog cars. But still, if we're living in late stage automobile design, the automobile is about to change and shuffle off this mortal coil as we know it, we still don't have to like it. Anyway, I've been Jenny List. If you like this talk, I'm going to talk to you for a very short while about Stitching Trans Rescue Foundation. This is the nonprofit of which I am treasurer. We're actually based over by the badge tent. You can come and talk to us. We help transgender people get out of very dangerous places. We're unashamedly here to raise money. And so if you'd like to come and talk to us, if you'd like to donate, please come and do so. Anyway, thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? You can tear me to shreds. <laughs> If you have any questions, please walk to the mics and uh, you can ask them. Hello. Hi. You first? Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. It was very interesting. I drive an electric car. I had been researching which car to drive for months okay. and, and ended up leasing for, for, the, for the first time in my life because there wasn't the perfect car. Yes. Um, so, but I was wondering, do, uh, did you hear about the Sono Motors car, with, uh, which comes only in one uh, variety, variety, 
and has a um, photovoltaic system. Sorry, can you repeat the make of the car? Sono Motors, S-O-N-O. -O. Okay, is that the one that looks a bit like a Volkswagen microbus? I, yeah, I think so. It, it, it's, uh, you can just get it in black and okay. uh, it has solar panels all around and their, their goal is to make a simple car. Have you heard Th about that? That? Is, that is a wonderful idea. I have seen more than one attempt to do that. However, I'll refer you back to the Crooks and Dreamers slide. Yeah. I would love to drive a car like that, but all the ones I've seen, I may not be quite familiar with the one you've described, but all the ones I've seen are either way more expensive or the company basically isn't going to belong to this world. I really want a car like that, and if I could get one, that's great, but I'm afraid... I would end up paying a lot more money than I can afford, and I might well end up with something with zero spare support because the company's gone bust. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, I'm not sure if they are getting ready. We, we had reserved one, and it's delayed, delayed, delayed. Okay, and I've yeah. heard mixed things, things, so I was wondering if you know about it and what your opinion well, is. Well, I may not be familiar with that particular one, but I've seen quite a few. There are also, actually, I'm a motorcyclist as well as a driver, and there are also some very exciting small motorcycles in the sort of 125cc class. And it's not impossible, as a lifelong, lifelong car driver and motorcyclist, I might actually become purely a motorcyclist mm -hmm. uh, for the same reason, because there are some simple ones there. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Hi there. Hello. Um, I won't thread you to threads because I really like your talk. Thank you. Um, uh, I always bought old cars and I did a lot of repairs on them yeah. uh, until indeed the cars became too complicated to do it yeah. myself and recently a lock failed and I had to like the ignition lock and I had to pay 400 euros because Blimey. it had to be reprogrammed. I was yeah. amazed. Um, um, I kind of fell over uh, it, um, like complexity is the new rust whether it's the the intention of the manufacturers to make a car that is um, very ob obsolete very soon. Because yeah. I, I'm wondering whether, I mean, you're blaming the manufacturer, but I think the manufacturer is also driven by us as consumers. Uh, so the, my question is, is it a deliberate choice of the manufacturers or is it lack of critical consumer feedback? I would say there's an element of both. Because, of course, the consumer... Because the trouble is, the consumer as in you and I, is different from the consumer who buys the cars. Because people who buy new cars, they don't buy them for the same reason we do. And yes, you're right, the consumer just wants toys. But the manufacturer is consciously making cars that are bad for maintenance. The manufacturer is consciously making cars with software licenses. The manufacturer is consciously selling friggin' heated seats as a service or whatever other stupid ideas. <laughs> the manufacturer is enthusiastically embracing this, so I'm still going to go with the manufacturers here. <laughs> yeah, but if you look like a fair phone, to look at the phone side, I mean, they kind of try to do what you're suggesting, okay. to, make it, to make it modular. Like okay, in, uh, I'm going to answer that, though. Outside this field, who has a fair phone? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, great, there, are, there is a Fairphone, but the fact is that virtually nobody outside our community has heard of it. Uh, so I would say that Fairphone, you're right, Fairphone are, are doing the right thing, but they are a very niche manufacturer. Yeah, so if, my, if Huawei my, my... start doing that, then I'm listening. But I would say that um, that approach, great, but I don't see any of the big manufacturers doing that. Yeah, and that's why I think yeah. so like, that's, uh, isn't that the take same this issue discussion with, uh, offline the, and uh, yeah, please give with, the with floor the to the next picture. Picture. Okay. question. Thank you. Go on. Hi there. Hello. Um, so first of all, um, I would like to thank you for addressing this because I think it's a real issue, especially when the population is growing and uh, more and more people want or need cars. Yeah. Um, at the same time, um, I would like to ask, um, because this, is, this still revolves around uh, car ownership, because yes. you have a car and at some point it stops working and you need to repair it or uh, buy a new one. And now, hypothetically, um, 
if there would be a future where car ownership isn't the norm. Because most cars, they are produced, then they are in parking lots for over 90% of the time, which is kind of a waste of resources, I'd say. So what if cars would not be personal uh, property, but rather be a service people can make use of? That's would fair. that change the conclusion of your thesis? Well, it would still mean that those cars, if they're over complex, would go on the scrap heap quicker, which basically means that they are less environmentally sound. So it doesn't, it doesn't change the, what you might call the hardware part of the thesis. But also, it's the same thing with cloud software. When I pay for something, I want to own it. I don't want somebody else to own it. And fair enough, I use Gmail because, I mean, geez, this is a Google presentation. Mm -hmm. um, but there are things where I draw the line. I want to own something. I want to own my CAD package. I don't want it in the cloud. Thank you, Autodesk Eagle. Um, I want to own my car because I don't want somebody else to harvest my every use of it and sell it to somebody else. I don't want to be beholden to a evil corporation on it. So there's, there's the hardware side of it that it doesn't matter who owns the car. If it's on the scrap heap in five minutes, that's a bad thing. But there's also the um, ownership side of it that I want, to, I want to be able to use my car on my terms. Also, I grew up, it come out in Brits a border eye. I grew up on a British farm. And these kind of shared models, sort of cars as a service, they're great if you live in a town. But most people don't. And most people don't live in the kind of town that has that kind of thing. If you live in a hollowed out town in the hinterland, you're not the first people to get these services. You're the last people to get these services. So there's still a big need for people to have vehicles they own, I would say. But from a hardware perspective, I would say the same completely applies, whatever the ownership model is. If the car is on the scrap heap before its time, then it's not sound. Yeah. Fair enough, thanks. Yeah. Uh, hi. Hello. Um, I'd like to disagree with you. <laughs> Please do. And uh, well, uh, first, I think uh, we're having a people problem. As you said uh, to the questions before, uh, people want gadgets. Uh, you, you shouldn't be hang angry at uh, car manufacturers, but you should be angry at people that just want to live with it <laughs> or try to change and uh, educate people to, to be more uh, sensible of this thing. And I'll take you on the 2030 bet. Uh, I'm sure there will be uh, not many cars in perfect condition in scrapyards. Uh, and another thing, sorry. Um, uh, cars are pretty resilient. Uh, like in a Tesla, you can remove uh, the center MCU and you lose the air conditioning and some community features. The car still runs. Uh, came in, uh, when I came here, I was playing with a CAN bus uh, of a Tesla. Yeah. And I shorted the uh, motor control bus, CAN bus, and it still drove fine. <laughs> <laughs> until and it just disable yeah. regenerative braking, uh, but there are also many op open source projects that are addressing this. Like there's uh, open source, uh, as you said, uh, uh, speedometers, yeah. uh, like an app from Android with an ASP32 connected to the CAN bus that works. Uh, and I'm sure there will be a thriving uh, community for this kind of project, which aims to remove the MCU and make the car dumber, uh, as you like it. But uh, I think it's uh, also uh, a generational problem. Like people with carburetors were complaining when uh, inj injection got introduced. <laughs> and it's also, yeah, you need, the, 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 the world is m more and more complex every day. So everything is more and more complex. Uh, it's like entropy, but uh, it, it's still accessible. You can still route a Tesla. You can still reverse engineer the CAN bus. Uh, well, it's just more difficult. I would turn around on the first point. Um, I'd say that uh, it comes back to that separate the subsystems thing. 
that, uh, fair enough, the customer asks for the toys, the manufacturer is not separating the subsystems. But also, I would say that, yes, there are all these open source projects, and they are absolutely great. The trouble is, they are not accessible to the kind of people who are not on this field. And it's great, yes, it gets more complex, but if you basically have to be the kind of person who goes to hacker camps to even attempt it, it's failed. Basically, that Triumph Herald, as I say, in a lot of ways was an awful car, but almost anybody in his backyard with a screwdriver could maintain it. Now, obviously, we have moved on since Triumph Heralds, but you want to go halfway to making it easier for somebody who isn't on this field. And I agree, there are some wonderful open source projects, but I have an electronic engineering degree. I can do this, but I don't think it's fair to expect the average bloke on a estate in my hometown of Vista to also be able to do it. Yeah, but where there's a will, there's a business. So if many people want this, uh, the people from the open source project will manufacture that is a, a true. product that you just plug in. There are many projects that went but this way. We've had these things for quite a long time and those businesses haven't appeared. And meanwhile, the, they have. Yeah, there are a few businesses like that, but it has not a mass market thing. Isn't so, yeah. but, but this please is move problem. the discussion yeah. uh, to outside and give room to okay. the next question. And by the way, uh, if we come along to WTF 2020, sorry, 2033, uh, there's a club martyr in that bet. <laughs> Hello. So, a, a very quick one, maybe. Um, we are adding the complexity to these systems, to the cars, to increase the safety. So in the 1970s, <clears throat> the car that you just show, we had about 20,000 people dying in Germany alone in road kills a day, uh, a year, sorry. Now we have about 2,000. Yeah, I'd agree. So we are yeah. saving, what, 18,000 lives a year? I mean, we can reduce airbags, we can reduce ESPs, we can reduce all of these microcontrollers, all of this logic. Right now, we are adding all the compute to the, to the cars to save lives. I would disagree with you. There is obviously a lot of technology in the car for safety. There is the design of the monocoque. There is the metallurgy of the monocoque. There are things like crumple zones. There are reactive systems like airbags and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. For sure. But it, the kind of things I'm talking about are not the essential safety systems. They are the ludicrous amounts of extra complexity in non-essential systems that is tied into the rest of the car. Of course we need safety systems. Oddly, that Triumph Herald is actually one of the safe cars I featured there because it has a separate chassis. There is um, a test data on uh, 1970s crash tests on a Triumph Spitfire, in which it actually came out quite well, because the chassis just going yoink, but that's uh, an outlier. <laughs> so yes, yeah, safe, sa safe, safety is obviously an important thing, but I'm not talking about safety systems here, because it's not the safety systems that are the problem. <laughs> Any other takers? Come on, this is a hill I'm prepared to die on. Come at me. You know? <laughs> well, if that's all, then thank you very much. And thank you for being a polite and attentive audience. <laughs>